Okay, so we're going to move on to our next session in here. This, and I hope you're getting out as much as, as I am. I'm trying to get into the comments thing, but I'm, I'm, but like you, I'm watching the speakers. So uh, it, let, I'll try and get in there and have a few chat. Maybe we can do we can talk afterwards in there. And the questions are just wonderful. So please keep those coming. This is just great. I haven't checked the leaderboard to see who's winning on here, but 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 I you you guys are all. Winners. If we ask great questions, we're all winners. So we've got a, a, a fireside chat coming up here, a little, little a panel, and I'm gonna, again, I get to sit back and, and listen to this one. Uh, and I, Kurt uh, Kurt Mummel, who's uh, the Chief Customer Officer at Data IQ. Am I saying that right, Kurt? Data yeah. IQ, is that? Yes, yes, that, that's perfect. Both my last name and the company name often serves uh, the question uh, on both counts, and that's exactly right. Uh, thank you, Jim. Great, and we've got Kevin Lavin, who's the Director of AI Insights with Deloitte, uh, Omnia, another, in, Great organization and there and some smart smart people at Delighton on this area. And Offer Shai, the senior director of machine learning and analytics from Loblaw Companies. You'll notice I didn't put an S on it. Offer so the, the you, you gotta give me credit for that. From Loblaw, which is also a company that's doing some great stuff in this area. I'm looking forward to take it away, guys. I'm 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 in your audience now. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jim, uh, and thanks, uh, of course, to the to the to the organizers and to the uh, to the audience for uh, for their attention today. So, uh, what we were hoping for in this fireside chat was really to talk about the topic of deploying data data science at scale within an enterprise. Um, and so, myself, uh, Kurt Mumel, I work for a, a software developer, a software company, a Data IQ, have a platform that allows, say, end-to-end uh, -end data science development and deployment, but also in a very collaborative manner. Uh, bringing across, uh, uh, kind of bridging the gap between the data scientists and the data analyst profile. Um, but I'm just really going to be moderating this discussion uh, because uh, who we have here uh, in, in in Kevin from Omnia at, uh, at Deloitte and Ofer from uh, uh, from Loblaw, they're truly the the experts here. Um, so my role is mostly just going to be uh, uh, getting out of the way, maybe uh, suggesting some some topics for uh, for Kevin and Ofer, uh, but, uh, but don't be surprised if we're hearing the most from them. They're the ones who are actually out there uh, doing things um, day to day. Um, so perhaps just to, to, to kick off the discussion, um, I think we what we'd like to is start with is maybe a question uh, and, and perhaps over if you want to uh, if you want to start with this one. Um, the question is about, you know, deploying data science at scale within the enterprise. You know, what what's really needed for success? Um, and I'm thinking in terms of, well, let's say everything in terms of infrastructure, in terms of training, change management, the strategy around that. How do you think about what is what is needed to to accomplish that? And, and feel free to say any words of introduction as well, uh, you know, about the, the scope of your responsibilities at, uh, at Loblaw. Thanks, Kurt. Um, yeah, in terms of my scope of responsibilities, I, I have a dual role. I manage the machine learning analytics governance at Loblaw for the uh, data insights and analytics team. Uh, as well as lead the machine learning and AI center of excellence. Uh, we have a very large team. It's, it's, I think it's past the 600 people now. Uh, and one of the key things I would say in terms of pushing out data science and scale uh, is having that support function. So it's very common for companies, and I think uh, our journey started that way as well, which is hire a lot of data scientists to in order to do a lot of data science. But really, you need a lot of infrastructure and support, both in terms of actual physical computing and uh, cloud infrastructure, but also you need engineers and you need connections with the business, you need product owners and managers, uh, you need people who understand what it is that you're trying to do and help you push that into uh, into production. And that's probably a key. It's you can't you can create a centralized function to address everything. Uh, we have people who specialize and connect very closely with the business uh, in order to make sure that they're building the right things uh, and then iterating quickly to get it into the hands of the users in the business uh, and the customers and make sure that we can move forward. So a lot of POCs, a lot of pilots and a very clear path on how to go from POC to pilot to production uh, you know, and, and through all that, we have governance functions around the modeling, around the data, uh, engineering teams, like I said. So it's really, it takes it takes a village, or in this case, a city, in order to be able to do this. Right. So it's sounding definitely like it's perhaps less of a technology question um, uh, and more of a change management question uh, for for the organization to really get to uh, to the level of scale. Um, 
Kevin, uh, I, you know, I'd love to hear your take. You know, working uh, working as you do uh, for for within Deloitte. Um, you know, uh, of course, you see many different organizations, many different industries. W what have you seen, and what what are you seeing as the let's say the requirements uh, to to really scale up the uh, the data science work? Oh, thank you. So. Working in a consultancy where we're supporting other organizations building out data science capabilities, what I've really seen is an evolution of how people think of at scale. At scale can mean large scale problems, so huge compute power, complex models, big problems. It can also mean at scale within the organization where you're looking at touching a lot of different facets of the organization and addressing greater breadth of problems as opposed to just greater depth of problems. And what I've been seeing over the last number of years is a focus on the breadth side of scale over the depth side of scale. And we're seeing organizations trying to broaden the lens from the, the billion dollar problems where you're going to need a complex deep learning approach to it towards finding those smaller, more bite-sized business problems that can be addressed in a quick, efficient way. To double down on what Oprah said, to get that breadth of scale, it becomes more of an organizational change management problem than it does a technical problem in many cases. In many cases, simpler machine learning approaches are effective for these smaller, bite-sized problems. The question is, can you spread the understanding of what can be done throughout the organization to allow the organization to recognize these problems and collaborate on delivery of them. So in the end, exactly as Oprah said, to do it at scale from a breadth perspective, you need appropriate collaboration organizational structures to be able to do that. Well, yeah, that's that's fascinating because I think early on, you know, we were we used to hear years ago, right? Maybe roll back five years. It was it was about big data. It was about having the right technology, the right, uh, you know, at the time Hadoop uh, infrastructure to to be able to do this. Uh, and then it became, you know, uh, Kevin, like you said, the uh, the deep learning. How do we apply this new technique to to our business to to do that billion dollar use case? Um, but indeed, this transition towards uh, uh, breadth of scale is, is really quite interesting. Now. Perhaps it would be useful for the audience to hear some perhaps recent successes, uh, so, some use cases that uh, that each of you have uh, encountered. Um, Kevin, is, is is there anything that you can share with us from uh, from what you've seen uh, to make this to make this real? What are what are people actually doing uh, today in terms of machine learning, in terms of data science or AI uh, out there in the uh, uh, in the industries? Sure. So I'll give you a couple of examples. One that is a little bit more depth focused, another that is more breadth focused. From a depth perspective, uh, we were working with a, a retail client on demand forecasting, building out a fairly complex, robust demand forecasting model to predict demand right down to the individual item at an individual store level there. So fairly complex modeling approach. And that model was used for a number of different purposes. It's used for deciding how much stock to keep, deciding how to do your pricing, um, understanding how different customer segments behave. Lots of applications for a fairly complex model there. That's sort of the more traditional go for depth approach there. Uh, it was effective. It was able to outperform the previous approaches that the organization was taking. And part of the reason why it was effective is that the data science team made up maybe 25% of the overall project team. Most of the project team was related to how is this going to be consumed by the organization there. The, the second example I'll give you is very much a breadth case. Uh, this was forecasting flows from water meters. It sounds like a small, simple thing, and it was. It was simple model, very simple modeling approach, um, a bite-sized project, if you will, but one that actually has quite a few use cases for different organizations. This can be was used by one organization to actually just make some simple forecasts to see what their utility bills are likely to be in the future and also to allow them to flag you know something seems to be going wrong there if there's a a leak inside one of the properties for example and your water bill is going up substantially simple things like that um, was also used for identifying flow meters that are faulty that are misbehaving so simple applications of a very simple model this was a small project it was a, a small team short duration run out very quickly and then consumed in a few different places in the organization. Again, 
very quickly and in a lightweight manner. So I like that as an example because it, it's my own background working for water utilities as well. But it's also it shows that ability to to hit breadth. This is not something you'd flag as a major use case, but if you can do it quickly and at a low cost and easily, this is the path towards small AI applications becoming more ubiquitous there. Yeah, I, I love it because it, you know, it sounds like there's a, you know, you're using a lot of the same data, but you're having all these different offshoots and applications coming from it. Just based on water flow, we can help the consumer understand their, uh, their, their future consumption, uh, help predict that, identify these problems uh, as well. So it's really, it shows almost that branching nature where you start with one idea, one source, uh, and you know, there can be so many different outputs from it. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Now, Ofer, uh, from, uh, from the Loblaw perspective, are there any, uh, you know, examples that, uh, that you might be able to share with us? about what you and your teams have been working on? Of course, uh, you know, we, it's uh, like, as I said, it's a broad team and we've been experimenting with a lot of different use cases and anything from traditional statistics to deep learning uh, is applied to both on the customer facing side, you know, things along the lines of recommendation engine uh, and experience in the store. There's been a recent story of uh, being able to uh, apply virtual makeup in the stores. Uh, some of the success stories that uh, we've seen though has been more on the operational side, so uh, hidden from the consumer. Uh, there's one that I can share on that front, which is uh, one of our recent uh, big major pushes, uh, you know, a system that really touches almost every aspect of our data in terms of uh, incorporating demand forecasting, incorporating supply chain management, incorporating uh, in-store uh, pricing and management of that. Uh, is how to uh, best address our issues around waste, uh, in particular around uh, the waste that uh, generated because of stale or expired items. So being able to uh, identify uh, when that's going to become an issue, mark down the price and promotions uh, around uh, reducing waste. And, and we're also already seeing results uh, in terms of both uh, savings to the company and savings to the customers. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And I love the the examples. There's one which is, you know, quite literally in the face of the customer, right? <laughs> the, uh, applying the makeup, right? Uh, uh, which is, of course, very tangible to the customer. But I think the second example really illustrates the degree to which a lot of the applications are increasingly, you know, in the core business on the operational side where it may not be visible to the consumer, but it's making the organization more intelligent, improving the performance, um, and then having, you know, ancillary benefits as well, reducing the environmental uh, impact of the, uh, the operations while also, of course, uh, saving costs. Now, um, perhaps uh, you know it, it could be useful to see how do you how do you generalize this into any trends that you're uh, that you're seeing in the market uh, today? You know, basically, I'm sure you know many people listening and watching right now you know, are are eager for you to pull out your crystal ball and tell us where are things going. Um, but perhaps, Kevin, uh, are there are there particular trends that you see emerging right now that you think are are worth sharing? Sure. So. The biggest trend I see happening in the marketplace and in the industry as a whole is I would call it a divergence, a divergence between the big deep problems and the smaller at scale problems. The big deep problems are getting bigger and getting deeper. If you read the literature coming out, some of the, the newest deep learning models there for language processing, for example, can cost upwards of $10 million in energy costs alone just to train the model once there. So they're getting bigger. There's research coming out showing that the current path of deep learning is getting closer and closer to the performance ceiling as far as it's ever going to go. And to get beyond that, the paths are going down the road of things like custom hardware just for deep learning as opposed to using general purpose computers. So the big problems, the billion dollar problems, they're going deeper and deeper and deeper, if you will. At the same time, the lighter solutions are getting broader and shifting from the need for technical expertise to that need for business knowledge, business users that understand enough of what's going on to be able to create those good use cases to drive teams. So essentially, some of the problems are going far more technical, getting right down to the, we need custom hardware to solve this. Others are going much more broad and general. And I'd say it's analogous to the divergence you had in computing decades ago when you sort of had a parting of ways from supercomputers down one path to individual personal computers on another path. I, I see something similar happening with AI and data science. 
Yeah, that, that's really interesting as well, because of course, where we are today, you know, we know that both are having massive impacts. The, the fact that we <laughs> thinking about, you know, the, uh, the personal computers sitting on our desks or of course the, you know, the uh, supercomputers that we carry in our pockets that we call smartphones uh, today. Those of course have uh, led to all these other changes in, uh, uh, in the way that we do our business, of course, the way that we lead our personal lives as well. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, uh, the, there still are applications for the, uh, for the, for the, the true supercomputers for the, uh, for the high performance computing uh, environments and it's interesting to see that uh, uh, that divergence today it's certainly something that we've uh, we've observed as well um Ofer, does that uh, does that resonate with uh, with what you've been observing uh, at uh, at blah blah uh, absolutely I mean from the technical perspective I think Kevin uh, hit it right on the head but maybe I'll add to that also that the merging of different and disparate data sources uh, some of the successes we've seen from academia and uh, research has been around combining text and image and videos to really um, move the needle in our ability to uh, comprehend the world, if you will, through models. I think on the business side, what I'm observing is uh, two things. So first of all, businesses, whereas before we're uh, approaching AI in the sense of, I need to do AI, I don't know what it is, but we've got to do it and we've got to hire data scientists, uh, they've shifted to understanding, I think you highlighted it before, understanding what it can be used for and how it can impact their businesses and wholesome adoption. Uh, the other one we're seeing is the democratization of AI. It's becoming a lot more accessible, a lot more uh, usable by people with uh, even rudimentary training in, in technical fields like computer science and uh, coding and bring it closer to the business. Uh, so. Uh, this idea of, especially from a business perspective, the idea of a highly specialized um, machine learning, deep learning data scientist, um, while not, I wouldn't say is gone, but maybe to uh, expand on Kevin's point, they'll become increasingly more specialized in those kind of use cases while the rest of the data science field uh, moves forward, you know, with, with less specialized skills and more broad understanding of the problems they're solving. Okay. Right. Nope, you That's a really good point that I would uh, love to double down on, Ofer, that democratization of access to data science. Uh, I know when you and I were both uh, academics long ago, we'd be given a few equations and said, here you go, this, this is the math, go forth and do your data science, and we need to code everything up from scratch there. And that has changed immensely and gradually over the last 15 years or so, First getting towards the point of pre-built libraries, then easier to use libraries, and now going to the point of auto ML and visual tools for doing that sort of thing. So it's really changed, and it's been a gradual change over years. In, Absolutely. That's really interesting because it's certainly something where we've observed some skepticism you know to, to what degree can you actually uh, democratize uh, these very advanced techniques um, but it sounds like Kevin and Ofer like you you're seeing that it it is becoming real in Kevin I think uh, you know the, the observation that it is gradual rather than you know just a just a sea change um, is uh, uh, is very astute but it, it it does sound like it's becoming real is is, is that uh, uh, is that your ob uh, observation? It is. I would say data data literacy is becoming more important than data science literacy. Um, you know, I think uh, you're probably familiar with your own experience and your own tool, uh, which promotes some auto ML. Uh, the the challenge is no longer in understanding the methods or understanding the math. To Kevin's point, it's in understanding how the data interacts with those models, how to interpret the inputs, how to prepare the inputs, how to interpret the outputs, becomes much more critical. Uh, than the actual methods themselves. And that interpretation is crucial. And something I've seen happening over a shorter period of time, perhaps the last five years. So five years ago, it was very hard to find data scientists at all. There just weren't many people coming out. Those that were out in the market, many of them were new entries into the marketplace, new graduates from school. There were very few people that were experienced practitioners that would had that experience that comes from doing a number of projects to build that intuition for what makes sense and what doesn't there. Um, as more people are getting more experience in the marketplace, the, the risk posed by using those simpler tools of people following them blindly without having that intuition and sanity check of, wait, this doesn't make sense, that can't be right, I must have done something wrong in the way I hooked everything up. That's growing as you're getting a bigger pool of experienced practitioners 
out there. Yeah, fa- uh, fascinating, and you know, I think it illustrates the uh, the shift in the mindset. You know, we we all love Kegel, we all love the competitions, but it's not just about optimizing uh, a particular metric on a model. It's about making sure that you understand what the actual impact is, what you know, what the model is telling you, and how you can you know if it's actually useful and appropriate to apply to your business or or not. Um, so just being conscious of time and wanting to make sure that we have enough time for uh, uh, for some questions afterwards, um, perhaps let's just reflect a little bit on uh, on the past 12 months, 14 months. Obviously, 2020 has been a uh, difficult, challenging year uh, for for many of us. Um, what are there? You know, are there any lessons learned that uh, that you're taking uh, from from your experience? Uh, perhaps starting with Kevin and then uh, moving to Ofer uh, uh, about you know that that 2020 experience. What do you see as those lessons learned? Um, and it may be related to the pandemic or just general trends uh, uh, in the market. So the biggest lessons I've learned in the last year related to this, uh, the first one would certainly be that you get more success by being more agile in these projects where you go iteratively through cycles of development as opposed to trying to be overly detailed and planning up front. And this is especially true for those smaller, call them the bite-sized problems as opposed to the big ones there. Um, related to that, I've found more organizations have a desire to do AI and to use AI effectively but there's still a lot of misconceptions out there about what it is. There are still a lot of people that think AI, they think Skynet, they think generalized artificial intelligence that once you let it loose, it's going to take over your organization. There's a lot of people on the other end of true skeptics that think it's all hype and there's nothing real to it. When the truth lies somewhere in the middle, that AI, machine learning, it it's advanced statistics is what it really is in the long and short. And there's a lot of great applications for it if you demystify it and help people to understand that this is what it really is, this is what it does there. And that demystification, I think, is going to be crucial for spreading the use of it over time. Absolutely, very, very clear. Uh, Ofer, uh, how about you? How, what are you coming away from the past year, uh, you know, thinking and you know, feeling that, you, that you've learned from, uh, from this experience? Yeah, I think uh, Kevin captured it very well on the uh, on the data science side, and, and you know, we've been fighting that hype for, for years now. Um, and, and I think I think it's getting to the point now where people are a little more savvy about it and uh, understand it a bit more. Uh, I would say, you know, for us as a company, obviously, uh, 2020 has been a mixed bag. Uh, we've had uh, we have our hands in groceries and apparel and pharmacies and, and all. So, you know, some parts of the business did better because of the pandemic and. Uh, I don't want to say thanks to the pandemic, uh, while well, others suffered. Uh, I think that just reflects uh, our own uh, needs and, and shifting needs as consumers during this pandemic. Um, you know, for certainly it elevated and accelerated our path to the digital space. Uh, it's something that Lava has been on for a while, um, but uh, th- this year alone basically tripled our digital business. Uh, and, and saw a big shift towards the business. So we've had to accelerate all our plans around how we engage with our customers and how we bring analytics to our engage, that engagement to ensure the best experience for our customers. Well, that's great. And well, I, I guess, is there anything else that you'd like to add, uh, Kevin, uh, or over uh, about the topic in general before we, before we open it up for, for questions? One other thing I've seen starting to build over time is an increased focus on ethics and governance around the AI systems and the models, not just the data. Uh, it's another trend that I'm seeing starting to begin, and I could imagine starting to grow over time. People getting more concerned with really understanding not just what it's being used for, but what's going into it. The model biases, the explainability, all those things seem to be growing as it gains prominence. Yeah, yeah and I think just to add to that, we, we, it's important that is, I think, uh, I've been happy to see just how broadly uh, this technology has been adopted, uh, mostly for good uses, uh, despite some of the stories that we've heard, um, you know, in making uh, businesses and people's lives operate uh, more smoothly, ultimately. Yeah. Well, no. Uh, well, thank you too. I, I think if we, you know, if we summarize, we're we're seeing this this trend towards towards breadth, uh, breadth to, towards more people getting involved. To 
let's say more concrete business impacts uh, coming from uh, uh, from the applications as well. But along with that increase in scale uh, comes the the greater responsibility to ensure that it is being applied in an ethical way, in a way which is uh, which is appropriate for uh, both the business, but also uh, the society uh, as well, which I think is uh, exactly the right uh, balance to be to be striking. Um, so just uh, we've got about four minutes left uh, in the uh, uh, the plan. Thirty minutes. Uh, Jim, good to see you uh, back on. Um, did we get yeah. any questions that we can? Uh, uh, that we oh, we got questions. Okay. Yes, we did. <laughs> the question is getting the nailed down to a, to a manageable number. Forgive me if I look like I'm reading because I want to. Re I want to get this one exactly here. But how do you ensure that you're building the best teams to tackle AI data analytical problems and applications? And it's a longer question than that, but I think that's a good start for it. Is that how do you get the best teams? I would say go for diversity first thing. Diversity of viewpoints, skill sets, and perspectives there. Uh, that's the number one thing. And making sure you're building teams where everyone's voice is heard and welcome there. Yeah, and I think that's true for probably any team in any field. But I'll add to that, uh, the shift that I've seen is from instead of looking for that big name that's going to lead your team and build their team around that, uh, I've seen a shift and I think a positive one overall to creating a strong team. So bringing in strong engineers, strong business people, and, and of course, strong data scientists, uh, because often strong recognizes strong, uh, even in other fields. So uh, instead of trying to rely on that one, you know, one strong data scientist that's going to make everything wonderful for your company, uh, look for a diversity of skills and and build around that. So perhaps seeing the end of the uh, the the data uh, data science unicorn, uh, you know, the the magical beast that can do everything. Um, instead, we're seeing this, uh, you know, bringing different skills and perspectives together. I was crushed when you told me that it wasn't AI wasn't going to take over the world. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm waiting for somebody else to run it because I'm tired. Uh, probably, uh, uh. There's a question, and I want to make sure I get this right because it was is the centralization, and this is something I encountered when, when we in the data warehouse days was getting trying to get data scientists or the early ones anyway, and, and, and things. So is the centralization of data science important to scale, or can you have a diverse, um, decentralized group? Does that does that make sense, guys? Uh, so, so we have we have a bit of a hub and spoke type model going on where you know even though we're technically all one team everybody is sitting very close to the business in terms of their day-to-day -day work um so, so i think what's critical though is centralization of data not centralization of data science in the sense that you need to be able to connect diverse data sources and not be limited by silo data I would argue that if you have one of those depth problems, centralization is important because you need a big team doing huge mm -hmm. things. But when you're looking to breadth, then decentralization of the data science, it's actually a benefit if you can go that route because you're spreading the understanding and you're demystifying across the organization. Yeah, really great point in there. In Yeah, because getting new ideas out, we talked about diversity, we talked about that, and but and having specialization. Good stuff. Um, we we're I've got hopefully I can squeeze in one more question, and this is a this is a, there's a number of them, but uh, you, the the world is going cookieless. Um, how does that affect the collection of data and 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 how we deal with data? Is that is that the problem you guys are looking at? Uh, maybe I can speak to that, but uh, it brings it brings to the forefront efforts around to collect data in, in other ways. So for us, for example, the loyalty program uh, is a major source, of course, of data. Uh, at the same time, it offers a lot of benefit to the customer. So uh, the idea that uh, customers will just hand over their data freely uh, is certainly shifting as our customers become smarter and, and more knowledgeable about how their data is being used as well, um, which means that uh, you kind of have to almost buy it from the customer by providing benefits and, and tangible benefits. Yeah. Guys, this this is, uh, uh, again, <laughs> another conversation that could go on. I, I, I've got a million things I'd like to talk to you guys, but, but thank you so much to, to all three of you for, for doing this. And, and uh, I, uh, Kevin, uh, offer for sure uh, great stuff that you're working on. Kurt, are, uh, 
people can check out the Dead IQ booth down there. Hopefully you'll be there. You'll be online. So hopefully people will link up and and uh, and network together as well uh, to get more questions to you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Jim. Thank, Thank you. you.